Hello. Bit of a departure from the norm this one, so rather than doing Range Rover axles, I'm doing a Rover V8. Um, if you like this kind of content, hit the old subscribe button. It does help the channel. Um, if you want to give me a thumbs up, thank you very much. If you want to comment, down below. Um, if you want to give me a thumbs down, it happens. Nobody's perfect. You can't please all the people all the time. If you want to contact me, Church House Classics, it's all one word, at gmail.com. Alternatively, you can go, as my phone interrupted me then, alternatively, you can go up to the channel header and right underneath the nose of my Triumph Stag, you'll see a link to my website. Um, there's a contact me option there as well. If you do contact me, make sure I've got some mechanism whereby I can return uh, the information back to you. So I need your email address. Um, and I'll do my best to help you. If you fancy buying me a pint or supporting the channel in any way, there's a PayPal me link below. Um, it's below this video in the description. There's no obligation. Any donations are gratefully received. Um, and thank you very much to all of those who have donated to the channel or bought me beer in the past. Um, you know who you are. I thanked every one of you personally. Right, let's crack on with this V8. Okay, so I visited the customer's uh, workshop a couple of weeks ago and I helped him helped him tear apart the Rover V8. Never done one before, but I thought, well, rather than me just taking the whole damn thing away, he was quite keen to understand how an engine might come apart. So we did it. We worked on it together. We tore it all apart. Um, kind of, you know, I charge a standard fixed hourly rate, but I don't charge any more for telling you exactly what it is I'm doing. So if you want to learn, then it might be an easy way of doing it for shits and giggles. Anyway, this Rover V8 uh, came out of his Series 2A 109 van that he bought recently. Not recently, a couple of years ago. But he bought it and then it overheated um, and then he replaced bits and bolts but was convinced that the engine was, was at fault here. So the engine was already out of the vehicle by the time I got there. Um, now, this engine is not standard to a Series 2A. It's still running the Series 2A gearbox. So uh, unless you kind of you know hit the uh, the diff lock or the four-wheel drive options, um, then it's going to be running through one of the rear drive shafts because there's no Salisbury axle on the 2A, I don't think. It might be. If it has got a Salisbury axle, then it probably stands a better chance. But this particular engine is out of a Rover P6 Saloon S. So it's the, uh, the rare manual um, gearbox version. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a bit beefy for a poor old Series 2A. Now, this is what he bought it with, um, and the idea is we'll get this up and running again. Um, he's going to keep his options open at the moment. He may want to go back to a two and a quarter petrol, but in the meantime, we're going to do this V8, and I'm going to put a build sheet around it, um, detailing exactly what has happened to it and the state of the bearings and so forth. Um, so if he does decide to sell it, he can sell it along with my Church House Classics build sheet for this V8 engine. Now, where are we? So when I first took it apart, and we'll go over the bottom end for now of this um, um, uh, engine shortly, but when I was taking it apart, I was generally finding it to be in quite solid shape. Um, piston rings, there was no real ridge at the top of the balls. It was all in fairly good shape. Um, and it was kind of thinking, well, why are we tearing this thing apart? Anyway, so we did, just, we did, did tear the whole thing apart, and I'll go over each of the individual components as we did pull it apart. Uh, but the head gasket had blown here. This is cylinder number one, passenger side, front piston, it had blown there, definitely. So I suspect what was happening was that the, uh, because we've got a cooling jacket here, goes to the head, I suspect that combustion was pressurizing the cooling system. The cooling system was popping its rag cap, overflowing to a point where the coolant level got too low and then the engine overheated. Okay, I don't think there was anything more sinister than that. I think the coolant level just got too low and that was it. So this has been over to the machine shop I use um, in Barnstable, Barham Engineering. They're good chaps they are. Barham Engines Limited. They're, uh, they're up near um, the river in Barnstable. Very, very good chaps. Anyway, what they decided they were going to do with this thing was they were just going to very lightly hone the cylinder walls. They were going to give the whole block a wash. It wasn't actually that far off this when we took it apart. And they were going to polish the crank journals. So no real engineering work required here. Just some very, very light touch work. 
Uh, I'm going to go back with the raw components uh, to the customer site and we'll build this engine all up. But in the meantime, what I wanted to do was just check over tolerances, just check the cylinders, etc., 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 clean up the pistons, um, go over the crankshaft, just check the bearing tolerances uh, so the customer can order all the bits he needs to order. Um, what we'll do, I think, is we will start with the crankshaft um, because it's been sitting around for a week and a half and my fault because I went home because it was my wife's birthday. Uh, we've still got old core plugs in here. We'll take those out in a minute. So crankshaft. Oh, shit, bastard. I just pinched my finger there. Not as much fun, was it? Right, crankshaft. Now, what I'm finding on this is there are a couple of very, very light marks. Now, when it comes down to putting these things together, obviously you've got a bearing shell that clamps around here. These are the big end journals. You get a bearing shell that clamps really tightly around there. But it can't be so tight that the crank doesn't turn. And it can't be so loose that the bearing knocks. Um, you need to find a happy tolerance. And what I do is I get something like this. So I just printed this off the net. I've got a number of these kind of documents. But what we're really looking at here, um, if we look at the main bearings, I've got the diametric clearance. So we're talking nine ten thousandths to two and a half thousandths or twenty five thousandths, sorry, um, of an inch. No, that's gone wrong, isn't it? So what we've got here is um, twenty three hundredths to sixty five hundredths of a millimeter is the is the diametric clearance you get. And you use something like plastic gauge to confirm that the bearings that have gone in are good we'll go over bearings in a second so you've got the main bearings that connect the crankshaft into the block you've got the big end bearings which connect the crank to the com rods and then you've got things like the piston rings and so forth and i want to check all of that lot really so what i want to do first of all i'm just going to get rid of some of these very 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 light marks on the crankshaft it's just really where i think just a little bit of let me get up here you see on this journal it's not rust it's just marks on it so all i tend to do a little bit of this is 2000 grade dry paper and that is enough to get those marks off oh this howard turned up with his mini that's not good news is it because i've just started this right Okay, so just going over each of the journals, literally a couple of seconds and all those marks have gone. And then I'm just going to spray some water dispersal onto it just to keep the crap away and stop it doing it anymore. I'll put this then in the container so there's no moisture going to go anywhere near it. So the next thing I need to do with this, now, now we're happy with the crankshaft. I've not confirmed the bearing sizes yet, but I can do that as part of the block because I've got the, the main bearings are still in here and I've still got the... Um, the big end bearings uh, are in the conrods and we'll come to those in a second. The main thing I wanted to do with this um, is first and foremost to check the bore size so we can confirm that. Some specialist tools to do that with. All looks nice and clean. Just clean up these block faces. The block's not been decked um, but here oh, here you can see that's where the gasket blew through. So that just wants to just dressing very, very, very lightly. I use composite gaskets when this all goes back together again. Um, there's nowhere else on this block anywhere that shows any signs of distress that concern me in any way whatsoever. I think it's all fairly straightforward stuff, this. It's a composite gasket set. Uh, we'll see this done. The other thing I like to check out on these um, is the... Can you see that? No, you can't. Let's turn it around. Here, this is where the camshaft runs through. And I want to just check these camshaft bearings. Um, there's no marks on them. There is five of them. They get smaller as they go further back. They're in good shape, I think. I'm quite happy with those. The worst ones I've seen are the ones that they end up with uh, copper. It's just a standard bearing. Uh, but when they get down to the copper, you know you've got, you've got trouble with that. Okay, and then all on the bottom of this block has all been cleaned nicely. You see the main bearings are still in it still. We'll take one of those out in a second and have a look. 
and then the rest of this really is just cleaning up the gasket faces ready for a reassembly. It's all fairly straightforward stuff, isn't it? Right, now where are we? Let's bring you down again. They're not massively heavy, these um these blocks, because they're all aluminium. Um but you do kind of you need to respect it, and I think when the block is bare like this, even a weakling like me can lift the damn thing up. Uh, but you have to lift, lift carefully. You don't want to be slipping discs and shit like that. Right, okie dokie. Now, in order to measure the bore, you need a bore gauge. I bought this a few years ago, and it is very, 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 very useful. And basically what you do is you position this in there with the right um, piece, work piece, and it will tell you what the tolerances are on this thing. So what we need to do is go back to the spec sheet, and I know this, but basically the ball is 88.91 millimetres or 3.5 inches. Okay? Because I'm an ancient old fart... I will need to find myself a hopefully I've brought it with me. Yes, I have. When you get a chance, find these these, these antique tools. This this is a you know obviously a micrometer, but this is a three to four inch micrometer. So more and right, it is an absolutely beautiful piece of kit. It really is. Um, and you know, I, I I love these sort of things. I have got a more and right ball gauge, but I, I didn't bring it with me. Unfortunately, it's still at home. There's a two to three inch ball gauge, like ball gauge, micrometer. And here we've got a zero to two inch with the original bill of sale. Look at that, 1963. Mr. A.W. Wright, Paisley. See, it why? It's just, I love it. Anyway. These little fellas here, you use these to calibrate. So on this, I know that is a one inch um, block. So I'll set this at one inch and I should just be able to squeeze that through, which I can. So I am comfortable that this one inch ball gauge is good. There's other ways that I can calibrate as well. And I do check them fairly regularly, um, but they're pretty bulletproof in all honesty. Now, in order to set this ball gauge, what we need to do is we need to set a micrometer to three and a half inches, which is there. That's three and a half inches across there. Um, yeah, three and a half inches. And then what I need to do then is configure this device here with whatever, so that it fills that gap. Now, hello, Swallow. Here's the vice. Now what I do is, not being mean to my micrometer, but just gently hold it in the vice, and then I can position that in there. Position the ball gauge in. Oh, we were one thousandth of an inch out, so, but you know, it's gonna make all the bloody difference when it comes to measuring. I actually need three hands here. This is why sometimes I prefer mechanical devices. Right, that's pretty fucking accurate. Yeah, I'm happy with that. So, there we are. Same, same sort of reading as I had before. Just helps if you can just position your micrometer. <coughs> Perhaps I should have put a piece of tissue around it if I was being really sensitive to it. And then what Actually, what you're doing here, let's get in real close here so I can show you how this thing works with my hangover. we on this ball here. What effectively you do is you keep... The way the ball gauge works is this slides backwards and forwards. And as that slides backwards and forwards, it adjusts the reading at the top here. Okay, so what I want to do is to push the ball cage into the engine and then sweep up and down 
holding one edge. So I'm pivoting off one edge. Doesn't matter which edge you pivot off, the little wheels on here will actually go against the side, the walls of the ball. And if I do that now, on this one, the minimum reading I'm getting on this is three and a half inches. So I think these are standard balls. Yes. Does that make sense? I hope it makes sense. We can double check in a minute. We'll check with the pistons as well. So belt and braces. Yeah, zero. So when that reads zero, then um, I am neither smaller nor bigger than three and a half inches. Okay? Which is exactly what I'm getting on each of these cylinders. That one is one thousandth. One thousandth of an inch, which is not big enough for a reborn. Um, right. So I'm fairly comfortable with that. That's good news. That is good news. So we're standard pistons. Okay, so I've been over and checked every single one of them. Checked at the top, the middle and the bottom. Um, and all of those balls are absolutely spot on. So, that's good news. Now, I will next, let's just turn you off. Next, we're going to look at the bearings. So we turn the block right upside down. These core plugs will need to come out as well. Um, because why wouldn't you? Now, we'll take off, we'll take off the centre. So the centre main bearing has got the thrust surface on it as well. So just these obviously this has not been torqued down. This whole thing has been washed but uh, it's quite grubby still. Now there's the centre main. And these bearings they look almost brand new. Let me get a pair of gloves on. So all of the main bearings I think are serviceable. Would you refit main bearings or would you buy new? Now, $64 million question. Gloves on. Let's take this bearing out. Out. Now, what I want to do is look on the back of this. There's quite a lot of um, machine wash in here, so this whole thing needs to be wiped down. Um, And on the back of this bearing here, we should have a make and also a size. Right, there's the make. These are 10 thou. 10 thou undersized. Part number S99565. They're not Vanderbilt, like the big M bearings are, but they're not bad. So it's just a case now of, <clears throat> see what I would do really is I would actually put a, um, something like a, um, a plastic gauge, I'll show you how to use plastic gauge, but put plastic gauge in there, install the crank, torque it down um, and see how, see how it, it reacts. When it comes to bearing caps, it's important these things are all put back on the right order. So they're all numbered apart from the back one. And they've all got an arrow pointing forwards. So you've got a direction that they need to go on. So that's the block, the bearings, so plus 10 thou of an inch. So the cranks had a grind at some point. But what we'll do next, I think, is get the pistons out. Let's put these back in. Get the pistons out. We'll have a look at those because I need to de-ring the pistons. I, mean, I think this engine has actually been rebuilt at some point, fairly with, within a few miles ago. Not not that many miles at all. Um, because all of these main bearings look really nice, really nice. Nothing wrong with the rope seal on the, the um, on the back there, but you know it happens. Right, stand you up there. Are you going to stay there? You are going to stay there. Let's go and get the pistons. Right, okay, so pistons, all eight of them. 
high compression pistons. Key thing I'm looking for here is big nasty scuff marks. Now these have not been cleaned yet. I will give them a clean. No nasty scuff mark. No nasty scuff marks. Tiny bit of uh, jittering down there. That's good. Uh, the other thing you look for on pistons is, is you've got the carbon burn ring around the top of the piston here. See that? You don't want to see that sort of black mess down here. Okay, because that would indicate that the um, the combustion is blowing past the piston rings itself. Um, we look at the gudgeon pins. You feel anywhere in it, it's fucked. <laughs> um, it's got a nice feel to it, that. Uh, these are all numbered, by the way. Now, again, they need to be numbered, and they've got a right way and a wrong way to go back into the engine. Um, we've got number seven has been marked onto onto the, the end cap there. But what we'll do, let's take this end cap off. We'll look at the bearings and see what they are. Right, there's the end cap. Now these, if I remember rightly, are Van der Velde bearings, but they've got some scratches and stuff on them. Let's just pop the piston back down there a second. So the piston itself, we've got no evidence that anything is spun in there. It all looks fairly healthy. They just want a damn good clean up, which is fine. I've got boxes to put them all in, into. Now, the bearings. Let's have a look. Right, so these are Van der Velde bearings, and they are plus 10, which would make sense. The bearing surface itself varies. So this one's got a bloody great tram line of a scratch down the middle of it here. And you can see also that while it's not down to the copper, it probably would have some life left in it. But while we're doing this, we might as well put a new set of bearings in for the big ends because it's inconsistent. I don't think they've done that many miles again, though. Let's take this one out. And here we've got, there's, there's been some contamination on this particular journal. You can see on the both sides of the journal, it's got the same tram lines. So there's been a bit of grit got in there when it's been running. And it's damaged a tiny part of the surface of the bearing, but not significantly. Let's pop this cap back on. So when you're doing these things, by the way, the piston has to go in in a certain direction. Now, sometimes you'll get an arrow on the top here. Because I'm not taking con rods off pistons, I will actually refer to the dimple and the notch. There, there's a notch there, there's a dimple there. They go on the same side, like that. I'm not putting the bearing back in that one. I'm going to take another bearing out and just have a quick look. Just confirm they're all the same. And then we're going to get the piston rings off these. So that bearing there. Showing similar signs of wear, but no tram lines. I don't know actually. See, these soft metal bearings, well, I suppose you can get them. There's, there's, there's Thorntons, there's a tram line in that one as well. Funny how the uh, piston rings are a piece of piss to get off. You get one of these. Piston ring tool, and all you really want to do is position the tool so it goes underneath the piston ring, and then you put the Wedge in the gap, whoops, and lift him the fuck off. There he is. One piston ring. Top ring. Let's have a look at these and see what they look like. So that's a top ring, and the top ring's got a step on the edge of it. The step goes upwards. See that little step there? The step goes towards the top of the bore. I think it's what it says in here. Um, where are we? Piston rings, number one compression ring, chrome faced, mark T or top. Chrome faced, T or top. So then you have to go, yes, it's top on there. It actually says top. And now we've got oil control rings. Now, one thing we do need to do is we need to measure the gap, the, 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 the distance between the ring and the groove. So I'll just use a feeler gauge for that. Um, and it is, so gap in bore, uh, clearance in groove, three to five thousandths of an inch. Let's go and get the, uh, 
let's go and get the feeler gauge. Right, three to five thousandths of an inch. Where are we? We'll go for the maximum, which is five. That's two, 2.5. We'll go for the maximum, because if three didn't go in. Oh, come on. Four, there it is, five. When you, but these tiny little thin ones, you actually make sure that you get just one feeder gauge out. And we'll wipe off. And then what we do is either the top or the second piston ring, we're looking to see if we can get that feeler gauge in there. And we can't. There's no way can I get that feeler gauge into that groove there. We try the second ring, exactly the same. Can I get the feeler gauge in there? No. So as far as I'm concerned, those rings are, uh, well, the, the pistons certainly are good. Right, what next? What we'll do next is we'll measure the gap in the ball. So by measuring the gap in the ball, you push the piston ring into the cylinder and you want to measure that gap in there. Okay? Now the easy way of getting these things in, obviously we're going to put it in the right way up, top. I don't want to be scratching the walls of the ball. So we'll pop him in and then use the piston just to push him down a little bit and level him up to make sure he's in square and straight. Okay? And the next thing we do is we look at the, the, um, the destrictions and it says here 17 to 22 thou. So if we go for, because um, there's definitely a gap there, go for 22 thou first of all, and I'm working in inches, sorry folks, it's what I do. 17, so we're bigger than 17, which we are, so I can get the feeler gauge into the groove. Feeler gauge goes into the groove. Now I want to get 22, I'll make sure that we're not bigger than 22. There's 22. It is pretty much bang on 22, that one. Pistons have all been cleaned. Um, and they've all been uh, rinsed through the parts washer. I just need to dry them off properly, get them all sorted out. All the piston rings came off in one tidy lump. I'm happy with that. Um, I can't find my um, plastic gauge, so I can't video that right now, but I'll add that on as soon as it arrives. Um, right, let's go on with the crank now, because I wanted to measure this. So let me demonstrate how I do the crankshaft. Let me just plug my phone in first of all, because the battery's getting flat on it. Right, so we're plugged in. Now, one crankshaft, basically got five main bearings, one, two, three, four, five, and we've got four big end journals, one, two, three, four. And the reason we've only got four big end journals for a V8 is because two pistons opposite each other share the same journal, quite common in V8. Um, right, so we need to do something a little bit kind of like, you know, organized when it comes to measuring bearings, but it's not difficult, it really isn't. So the way I do this, I pop my arse down here first of all. Um, I find the standard journal diameter for the big end. Now, sorry, for the main bearing. So we'll do main bearings first. So main bearing. Um, and the standard diameter, we'll do it in inches because I prefer doing it in inches, is 2.299. So standard 2.299. I've only worked thousands of an inch, there's no point going to the, the, the you know, 2.992 to 2.997. For the purpose of this exercise, we're going to find out that these, these journals are um, 10 thou undersized. So we have got a 10 thou, which needs to be taken off this, which is 0, 1, 0. Basic piece of mathematics, 2.289 is the measurement we're looking for in inches. Okay? get my trusty two to three inch um, micrometer and we can wind this out so we're two inches already I'm going to wind it out to 2.2 .2 on this horizontal scale here you know how these things work you must know how these things work if you don't know how these things work this is how they work so basically we've got 2.2 .2, 0.1 and then 2.2 .2, 
and then each of these little graduations on here these vertical graduations on here is is, is 0 0.25 sorry 0 0.025 so if i want to do if i want to measure out 2.289 i would go to 2.2 three of the vertical graduations that's three so i can see three there one two three and then i would add 10 on it that's going to give me 2.285 is about there okay now unfortunately this one hasn't got a lock on it it probably did have a lock on it at some point but it doesn't anymore so i'm just going to be careful how i handle because i don't want to be jogging it and it's simply a case of positioning one end and seeing if the other end will slide over the top and do you know what it does so I'd say that that one is bang on. Same with this one. Perfect. 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 And perfect. So both bearings and crank are 10 thou. Um, ground which i'm happy with now if i was going to go absolutely berserk on this thing i would actually then rotate the crank but i know this thing has been um it's been ground correctly because basically you want to check on two different planes make sure the crank journals aren't ovaled then that's how you do that for some reason none of that bloody videos right okay we're going to measure the big end journals now so let me just pop the two to three inch uh caliper away we don't need you, sir. You've been most helpful. Thank you. You can go back in there. Now, basically what we're looking at, the journal size standard is two inches. We're going to take 10 thou off that. So that leaves us with one inch, um, 990 thous. Yeah, so 1.990. Now, I've measured these as one thou smaller. So basically what we do, we take the, this is the one to two inch. Um, so we go to... Uh, obviously more than an inch we'll wind him out on the horizontal scale here to nine so we can see that and then we want to get as close to 90 as we possibly can so i get three graduations on the 75 and add 15 thou which is there we'll tighten him up so that's the that's the measurement it should be that's 1.990 inches put him on the big end journal It's not bad, but it just feels like it could go a little bit tighter. So I'll then take another thou off to reduce the diameter. It's just undo the lock for a second. So rather than 15, we're going to go to 14 on the rotary scale. So it's one thou. And that feels better. That's how I would expect it to be. And they're all exactly the same. Which is where I got this measurement from, that these journals are 1.989 rather than 1.990. Now, one thousandth of an inch, I think, is acceptable, because when I look at the big end bearings, and I look at the diametric clearance, uh, they're talking um, 0.6 to 2 thou. Yeah? Now, we've got 1 thou here, so I think that's going to be acceptable. I think the diametric clearance is going to be okay, because uh, I've got a 1 thou grind on this thing it probably could go a little bit further i mean a bit of light polishing and so forth you probably still run uh, a, a 10 thou undersized bearing on it but i'm happy with the crank i think that's <laughs>